So tonight we have Jake here. We're featuring this book, Nine Years of Anarchist and Agitation. And um, this event is sponsored by Common Struggle, anarchist, libertarian, communist organization. So you can like us on Facebook. And uh, you can find us uh, on Facebook. And then also I have a sign-up sheet on the table. If you're interested in receiving emails, we have a book group um, and different events. So I wanted to introduce my young comrade, Jake, here. And I just have to refresh my memory what I wanted to, uh, to touch on here. So I think the main thing I got from this book is um, it's a great history of the recent past, the 2000s, uh, and the things that were going on specifically in Boston, Mass. But it's set in the context of what's been going on in the 2000s since 9-11. So it's got this very interesting historical you know, thing, uh, resonance going on. So um, the Boston anti-authoritarian uh, anti-military, it was against military, was the first part, was the first iteration. Well, is it Boston anti... Boston anarchists against militarism. Boston anarchists against militarism was the first name. Bam. And then it went through a change, and then it became the Boston anti-authoritarian movement. Um, but it's the stories of... Um, there's a long history, there's a history of, of the movement from 2001 through 2009, which is really, really interesting um, because it locates a lot of the global history. And also, it looks back in time to anarchists in the past and some of the debates that was, were going on. So this is called Nine Years of Anarchist Agitation. And so in that way, the way I was reading it, there's a lot of insurrectionary anarchism, a lot of those ideas in it. But there's also a discussion. Um, there's a bunch of different discussions about how organizational anarchism fits in there. And so there are historical looks in the past at um, debate, for example, between Nestor Makhno or letter, letter exchange between Nestor Makhno, the Ukrainian um, anarchist, um, peasant, military uh, leader, uh, when they were fighting the the uh, Bolsheviks, and then they, they go to Paris, and then he, Malatesta, a famous insurrectionary anarchist in the U.S., and, and, and Nestor Makhno have this letter writing exchange, which was like one letter a year or something, right? It was over in the, in the 1920s. It's just a very, very interesting discussion about the, the, the tension between insurrectionary acts and organizational anarchism. Um, so, and that occurs within BAM itself. You know, there's some, some uh, discussion about um, how popular the, the organization was at the start, how fired up everybody was, and, and how it quickly turned into all these different positions that happen within the anarchist milieu that can happen. So um, I think this is an excellent part of the, the book. And uh, so without any more introduction, here's Jake Corman. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, Anne-Marie um, and the other comrades from the Western Mass Local of Common Struggle. It's really awesome that you know them and uh, this great bookstore are hosting me here tonight. Um, so the book, yeah, is called Nine Years of Anarchist Agitation, but this week um, is another anniversary. It's the 10-year anniversary of the start of the Iraq War, which is kind of a bad anniversary, but also it's the 10-year anniversary of when I became involved in, you know, anarchist groups. Um, it was the Iraq War that really spurred me on. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to sort of celebrate tonight kind of as like a, you know, a night for me to look back on 10 years of my life, which... Um, being younger than 30 is a big chunk of my life. Um, so I'm really happy to, to share that all with you and talk about my book. Um, so yeah, my name is Jake Carmen. Um, I was born in Franklin, Mass. Well, I was a little kid in Franklin, Mass. I was born in a hospital in Boston. 
um, <laughs> and moved into the city when I was like 18. Um, when I was 16 is when I, when the Iraq War started and I uh, joined BAM. Um, I currently work as a grocery store worker and I do a lot of writing, uh, music, art, and a bunch of other things. Um, so this book is a collection of writings from the BAM newsletter. I feel weird saying behind this. Am I going to mess up the video? But, no, you can. Um, <laughs> from the BAM newsletter, which was a publication that the group put out monthly between 2007 and 2010. Right at the end of that, I thought it would be nice to look back on the decade that this group had been active and start writing history. Um, as I started writing the history, however, um, I was also moving to Pittsburgh, um, and there wasn't really enough energy left in the group to sustain it so it collapsed. Um, so instead of having that history be a serial piece in the newsletter, I uh, ended up putting it in a book with, with some of the rest of my writings at the uh, um, encouragement of a good friend of mine named James Herod, who's also the main editor of this book. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, as Anna Marie mentioned, there are also a lot of different kind of conceptions of anarchism and different positions people can take. Um, so, regardless of whether or not um, you all are have your own definitions of anarchism, I, I think it might be useful for me to read one of my own, um, just so that you kind of know where I'm coming from. This is just a very short section from um, the first of my essays in here called The American Dream and the Anarchist Dream. Um, <clears throat> so, the American Dream is a vision for a new free world a society where all humans live in equality, where the things we build and grow, the things that Mother Earth provides her children, are not to be hoarded by the selfish and violent few, bosses, governments, corporations, but to be shared by all. In such a free world, nations and governments will be replaced by the free associations of communities, villages, neighborhoods, to organize and self-govern as they see fit. The bosses that hold our time and our stomachs hostage will be replaced but only by us, the workers, organized together in non-hierarchical collectives, such as this bookstore, um, unions and associations as we see fit, so that we may share the products of our labor among ourselves and with our communities, so that we may create that which we as human societies need, instead of just that which will make our bosses the most profit, so that we may create on the principle of from each, from each according to ability to each according to need, so that we may eliminate the useless jobs, the banks, the insurance agencies, the greedy corporations who got us into this mess of poverty in the first place, and reorganize the vital jobs in an egalitarian manner, so that we may carry out our labor without carelessly destroying the earth, without which humanity, like all other living things, is doomed to a dull and lonely existence on the road to extinction. Um, so, you know, my conception of anarchism comes from um, really the, the socialist workers movement of the mid-1800s, um, which was influenced, I think, a lot by the various Republican revolutions before that. Um, it was sort of the experience that they gained that really uh, coalesced this new movement of uh, socialist workers that spawned two uh, very distinct philosophies, uh, one of which was Marxism, and one of which was uh, the social anarchism that Bakunin uh, developed um, and developed circles of uh, revolutionary workers around. Um, so it's from that sort of social anarchism um, that, you know, I, I, I guess I take my political stand. Um, <clears throat> so then in, you know, having described what I believe anarchism is, you know, what, what the ultimate goal of the anarchist is, or it should be, um, another important aspect of uh, revolutionary politics is organization, um, what types of organizations and what the roles of those organizations are. Um, and sort of the way I look at it in non-revolutionary times, um, such as the ones we live in, um, anarchist groups have really two primary roles, um, one of which is you know, uh, spreading the idea like education, agitation, that's mostly what BAM focused on. Um, another equally, if not more important, role is to participate in the ongoing social struggles that are happening across a broad spectrum of, of the political scale. Um, 
And to participate in these to both build you know, stronger organizations of the oppressed people um, and confidence of, of you know, the oppressed class um, to continue struggling on, but also to push for you know, greater democracy within those organizations and you know, more direct and revolutionary tactics and strategies in those struggles. Um, so that's something that, you know, participating in social struggles wasn't one of BAM's strong points, and I'll, I'll criticize us for that a lot probably tonight. Um, the times where we did specifically put ourselves together to kind of engage with our neighbors and our coworkers were definitely the times where we were, I guess, the most successful and there was the most excitement, you know, in the organization. Um, <clears throat> um, so, you know, another thing that anarchist group, groups do a lot besides the spreading the ideas and the participating in social struggles is, you know, the conception of action. Um, I think a lot of my anarchist friends would have yelled at me for not including action as one of those three, uh, two other points. However, I think that action is more of a set of tactics that one might choose to use for either of those other two points, either to... A, a lot of actions that anarchists take in the United States are specifically just actions to, you know, strike a blow against more of a uh, philosophical opponent, almost, uh, more against an image or, a, or an idea, um, and that isn't always communicated very well to the people that they're trying to communicate to. So an example of this would be at a summit protest where anarchists smash windows of, let's say, Starbucks or whatnot. Um, I think that often during these moments, um, they're taking this action um, with the reasons of spreading the idea of anarchism. Um, I don't think that's often very successful. Um, other actions can also be used to participate in social struggles. Um, you know, people can, for instance, stop evictions. That's something that's become a really widely used tactic in Massachusetts um, since the housing bubble burst um, in city life in Jamaica Plain really stepped up with that. You know, it spread to Springfield and a lot of other cities across the country. Um, and, you know, that purpose of that action is to, you know, first and foremost, keep the person in their house, but it's also building this movement of people who believe in, you know, housing justice and the right of housing for everybody. Um, so that's action building social struggle. Um, not to say that both action can't be good or both action can't be bad, given the circumstance or the time. Um, so I guess that's a kind of quick overview of sort of, you know, my thinking about anarchism before I get into um, this organization that I was a part of for many years. Um, <clears throat> so, um, BAM, as it was mostly known, was founded in October of 2001. Um, so it was right after the September 11th attacks. Um, I was I was an, uh, a freshman, I was a sophomore in high school at the time, and I, I remember the you know, the general sentiment, at least among my peers and my, my parents and, you know, the communities that my family was a part of. People were pretty paranoid and um, it was a pretty scary time to have different ideas. Um, you know, I went to a school in which I was the only only anarchist, which isn't really surprising considering I was 13. Um, so, <laughs> or four, 14 at the time. Um, <laughs> However, people didn't like me very much, so that, that was something that, you know, definitely added to, like, my development um, as, a, as a thinker. Uh, I spent a lot of time at that time just watching the news and kind of trying to figure out what was going on. Um, I was young. I didn't really understand things very much, and it was pretty confusing. Um, meanwhile, in Boston, um, anarchists who had been active, especially in the anti-globalization movement in the late 90s, um, you know, who had come to sort of the same frustrations that I had I mentioned previously about, um, you know, summit actions, um, sp you know, specifically with the goal of, you know, property destruction and other, other issues um, of anarchist organization and the difficulties and such, um, who were influenced a lot by Nessa Machno, who Anna Maria uh, mentioned before, formed uh, the uh, NEFAC, the Northeastern Federation of Anarchist Communists, um, 
that was in 2000, and it was very big in Boston. I think there were about five or six collectives around the time of BAMS forming. Um, so anarchists around these circles, um, when they saw the, you know, that the, this country was about to march off to war against pretty much anybody, um, you know, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan seemed like the obvious first target, but, you know, everybody pretty much had the feeling that Iraq would be next, and who knows how long it would be for. We're still waiting, um, 13, 12 years later. Um, but anyway, these anarchists uh, formed a, a broader and public group uh, called Boston Anarchists Against Militarism. Um, the idea being that, you know, the people in EFAC had a very specific, you know, political position being, you know, specifically anarchist communists coming from the uh, Machnavist, uh platform-based tradition, um, but they wanted to bring people together um, as, a, as a force against the war um, at a time where it was really unpopular to do so. Um, so that was sort of the beginning, <coughs> the beginning of BAM. Um, and being among the first to stand up against the war, um, they really got a lot of attention at the beginning. Um, they were key to the, the different partnerships in Boston that called the first protests and always had you know a, a space to speak during the rallies. Um, they also held a Skillshare a couple months after the war started at MIT, um, where um, you know people talked a lot about about the war, about how to stop it, and about different political ideas surrounding it. Um, however, as Anna Maria mentioned earlier, um, that was. Uh, the group soon ran into issues internally um, where, you know, there were different debates about, you know, what the group should be, um, pretty much, what it should be based on. Um, so on the one hand, during this uh, beginning of the Afghanistan war, after this initial huge success that BAM was having in terms of membership and influence, um, people started kind of getting discouraged by the fact that the war was ending, the anti-war coalitions were um, becoming decidedly more, uh, I guess, on the Democrat, Democrat political, politically Democrat end of, you know, the, of the spectrum was gaining a lot more power um, in the anti-war movement. Uh, the anarchists no longer really had their place to, to speak at rallies and um, <clears throat> things like that. So those anarchists who had been very involved in the anti-war movement in Boston early on started taking a step back out of frustration. This led to the internal debates I just mentioned, um, which seriously splintered the group, and it was splinters that lasted for about four or five years in Boston, where people wouldn't talk to each other, or were, would talk to each other, but it, not in the nicest terms. Um, <clears throat> but out of this change, um, there were a few people uh, who were uh, up really in the opposition to the founding groups of, of NEFAC um, who wanted to keep the organization going um, and keep it as a broad group but make it its own collective as opposed to a coalition of anarchists. Um, which made a lot of sense um, as you know, NEFAC folks left. NEFAC members all had their own collectives in the city so to them BAM was a, a coalition of groups but to most of the anarchists in BAM, um, in the, the later half of this first segment, um, it was their only group. You know, BAM was their group, and that's sort of what BAM became, um, a, a pretty small um, collective of anarchists, you know, opposed to the war, but also with, you know, some broadly defined political positions, you know, most, mostly social anarchists. Realistically, almost all the anarchists in Boston at the time were anarchist communists, and the big debate was between <coughs> platformism or no platformism, um, which seems kind of silly, but you know, the, that was sort of my coming into the group. It was this this split? You know, and me being a youngster, I was like 16 at the time, didn't know what the hell the platform was. All I knew was that you know the people in the group I just joined were against it, so it must be bad. <coughs> um, <coughs> So moving on from that, um, yeah, so <clears throat> the two main things that BAM was doing during the beginning of the anti-war movement were actions and skill shares, um, both of which continued for a while in BAM. Um, 
So I, you know, I mentioned kind of where I, where I was coming from at the time, but I'm going to read a short segment. You know, in fact, I think I'll just tell the story. Um, it'll be more interesting. I won't be looking at the book the whole time. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when I, that, that school I had been at um, when September 11th happened and I was the only anarchist in the school, it was a fairly hostile place for me to be. I ended up transferring to like a, a high school that specialized in art um, for my junior year, and it was called the Cambridge School of Weston. Um, it was a very strange place, but it was a lot of fun too. Um, and in my first week, I met a lot of other anarchists. Um, I thought I was like the only anarchist alive because, you know, <laughs> other than Kurt Cobain, who had already died, from whom I had originally heard of the idea. Um, the only other anarchist I was able to find with my very, very poor internet skills as a, you know, 13 or 14 year old were like Kropotkin and Emma Goldman who were long since dead and whom I could barely understand. Um, <laughs> so, you know, in, you know, the fall of 2002, meeting these other anarchists was like mind boggling for me. Um, I came from Franklin, which was a, you know, a small, at the time mostly a farm town with some mills mostly that had been closed. Gradually, quickly developed into sort of like an industrial area, um, but I was pretty sheltered, I'll say. Um, so meeting other anarchists, they you know they took me out to Boston to drink and eat vegan food, which I had no <laughs> idea what vegan food was either. Um, but learning that there were other anarchists, or other people who shared my ideas, was you know pretty important to me. Um, so we were also all you know going into our sophomore and uh, our junior year. Um, <clears throat> getting close to 18 and with, you know, it, it being pretty obvious to everybody that there was about to be a war in Iraq, um, at least for my friends, I can't speak for the rest of the country, but we were pretty certain there was going to be a draft. We were pretty worried about that, that this war war against terrorism was going to blow up, um, become like a, almost another world war. So we were very worried about the draft and considering different forms of draft resistance. Um, <clears throat> So when the Iraq War actually happened, um, I think the initial bombing was March 19th, 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> I was very, very mad. I remember watching George Bush on TV saying, in three days we're going to start the war in Iraq, and you know, just wanting to break things, being a you know, very scared and angry young man. Um, so the, uh, the day the Iraq War started, I was actually standing in Newbury Comics in Harvard Square, um, and a friend of mine, one of these anarchists I had met, came up to me and said, hey, you're already wearing black. Come to the protest. You know, we're, the, the war started. We're, we're marching. I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> At that point, I was pretty much like, I'll, I'll do anything. You know, um, I was really at that point. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we showed up in Copley. Um, anarchists had actually called for this demonstration to happen. Uh, NEFAC had put out a call. Um, internationally for the day after the war in Iraq to started to have protest marches. Um, some of you may be familiar with the organization ANSWER, um, but they actually showed up at this event with sound trucks, told everybody, we're not marching, we have a great lineup of speakers, you know, we're just going to have a rally, um, and then immediately pointed the police towards where the anarchists had gathered to, to start the march. So this is sort of my introduction to, um, you know, being an anarchist on the streets or what that had meant at the time. Um, so my friend had bought me a bandana, and you know we went to the collective house and carried the flags and all that, all that fun stuff. But um, as we got prepared to march and put our masks on and all of that, and the police started surrounding us, you know, it was, it was real, you know. Um, and I hadn't been prepared for this at all. I had my ID in my wallet, um, which. You know, most of my friends had said that they were going to do jail solidarity, which means not tell the police your name, um, which has many legal benefits potentially. Um, I won't explain them here, but you could research them, um, <clears throat> especially if it's in a large group. So we lead a breakaway march from the event that we called, um, actually marched down Newbury Street, and you know, almost immediately the police were very violent with us. You know, pushing people, driving their motorcycles into people. As we get to the end of Newbury Street, everyone starts running for the Mass Pike ramp, um, and that's where like things really got pretty crazy. Um, a motorcycle drove straight into the the crowd, and you know a cop got knocked off the bike, and 
you know, all the other cops came in. At that point, my friends were like, you should get out of here. You know, you got your license and stuff like that. So I uh, had to jump a fence and hide in a store. And, you know, after that, I was pretty set on <laughs> this. This is what I was looking for. Um, however, I quickly realized that wasn't really what I was looking for. Um, you know, I went to, to some of the skill shares and, and got involved at the beginning. But, um, you know, having come to anarchism through Emma Goldman and Kropotkin and Berkman and all of them, my understanding of anarchism was, you know, we should be with the people. That's, that's the point of anarchism, right, is to build a world where the people are free. Um, so that should be the, the bulk of our work is with people who aren't anarchists, who are just fighting for, for their lives at the time, fighting to you know, make their lives better, to protect themselves and their communities. Um, and that wasn't what we were doing at all, and I was kind of confused about this and didn't figure it out until years later. Um, <clears throat> but that's sort of how I got into it. Um, the following summer, uh, the Democratic National Convention came to Boston. Um, this was another big milestone for BAM. Um, BAM members founded the Black Tea Society um, which uh, was very, very active in the year before the DNC um, had a lot of very positive media coverage because instead of calling itself anarchist, they it called itself a, an ad hoc anti-authoritarian movement. And anti-authoritarian, you know, wasn't isn't a popularly used term. To anarchist, it just means anarchism. But to most people, they're like, oh, anti-authoritarianism. You know, I don't like dictators. Um, <laughs> so <coughs> I was. Um, as, as the DNC crept closer, however, we also, beyond the attention from the media, which we had, you know, every meeting we had a couple of newspapers or TV news who wanted to report on the meeting, um, the police and the FBI also got a lot more interested in what we were doing. Uh, one of our meetings was shut down by the Secret Service. People were being harassed. There, one guy who was peripherally involved in the group's mother got a visit from the police in New York City. Uh, don't you know your son's going to be attending this? Um, about uh, eight, eight people were arrested in uh, Central Square, Cambridge, which is the next city over from Boston, um, in April before the summer of the DNC um, for doing a Homes Not Jails action. And they were accused of creating a, a weapons catch for, for the anarchists for the DNC. And that case went on for over a year. Um, so the. Uh, the repression was definitely coming, and you know you could see that these uh, authority, <laughs> authoritarian agencies had a lot of money with which to spy on kids. Um, they were using it, so um, we were pretty paranoid going into the DNC, and you know it wasn't nearly the success we had hoped it would be. Um, there was a really, really democratic bazaar on the Boston Common, which is pretty much a big, cool festivity. It's kind of like the really, really free market, which, in which everything is free, as in it would be in anarchist communism, as opposed to free market capitalism, where nothing is free, um, except, you know, well, anyway. <clears throat> um, we had a decentralized day of actions planned that um, didn't really pan out the way we had hoped. Most, most of the groups, you know, there weren't many affinity groups doing their own autonomous direct actions. Um, a lot of the groups were really busted up before uh, the summit happened. Um, my own group included, um, people were arrested, you know. Um, and then there was, the, the third prong was a, a big march <coughs> towards the uh, convention center, which was, you know, where, where the Bruins and the Celtics play, actually. Um, and they were, the police had created two zones. They had a soft zone around the wide periphery and then a hard zone directly around um, the convention center. Um, and our group had pretty much said, we're not going in any of the zones. It's stupid. It's caging ourselves in. However, the march went into it. Um, so I, I showed up at Copley that morning, uh, very paranoid already. A uh, truck pulled up with all these supplies um, because we were having an anarchist pirate block. So there were pirate ships, and someone handed me a sword, and I said, I'm not going to touch that sword. It might be misconstrued for something dangerous. <laughs> Um, so instead, I grabbed a pirate hook, made it out of paper mache. I figured no one would confuse this with anything bad. Um, so we, we go on the march. Um, we end up entering the soft zone before I can get anyone to leave with me. We get into the soft zone. We start, you know, uh, 
mostly it was a big circle of media with like a few people burning like a effigy of, bu of Bush, um, maybe a book or something. I don't know what was going on, but people were dancing around the fire. Um, and the cops were getting really angry, and we were looking up, and there were snipers on the, you know, the raised train line and the buildings behind barbed wire. It was pretty scary. So I'm like, well, I'm 18 to begin with. I'm like, hey, guys, let's leave. Anyone want to leave with me? Um, so I'm trying to get people to leave, and I get up, and I turn around, and I see a snatch squad, which is when the police send about five or six cops into a protest or other demonstration to target specific people for arrest. Um, we'd all learned about this in our training, and I stand up and I'm like, oh, I wonder who they're coming for. And they get about, you know, 10 feet from me, and I realize they're coming for me. So I try to get out of the way. Um, eventually I'm tackled, and people kind of swarm around me trying to de-arrest me. The police end up dragging me down the street for about two blocks by my arms while my bandana slowly falls down my face. And the media all lines up to take pictures, and my grandparents got... <laughs> The picture of my face being dragged down the street on their doorstep on the front cover of the Herald the next morning, which was just wonderful. Um, <clears throat> and eventually it came out in court that what I was being tried with, after all, um, was possession of a Molotov cocktail, because that pirate hook that I had thought was so innocent and innocuous um, at first they tried to say it was a real Molotov cocktail, and then when they couldn't indict me to a federal court about it, said, oh, no, it's just a fake Molotov cocktail. Um, so, <laughs> that was wild. Um, <coughs> luckily, I got free legal service from the National Lawyers Guild and got off. Uh, I, I got a not guilty conviction from the uh, verdict, not guilty verdict from the judge, um, but it was pretty scary six months after that. Um, so moving on, in the immediate aftermath, it was this terrible burnout. Um, you know, a lot of our core organizers were just pretty much done with the group. Um, right after that, the people who had kind of kept BAM going during the big split, when it was in, about to dissolve, had decided they were going to move to Tennessee um, to start a farm commune. So they were kind of attempting to transit out of the group that they've been so central to and, you know, pass on their roles and responsibilities to other folks. Um, but, you know, people being so burnt out and most everybody besides, you know, the, these folks were quite young. So it wasn't a very smooth transition. Um, after they left, there was a couple of years where we were trying to hold skill shares that were going terribly to the point where we pretty much stopped doing skill shares. Um, and, you know, around 2004, 2000, early 2005, the Skillshare stopped being a really central aspect of what BAM did. Um, <clears throat> we continued to try to, you know, do actions and kind of confrontational elements to, you know, protest marches, except we really didn't have the discipline that we had before and, you know, the knowledge of street tactics. So that was, you know, not turning out well, people being arrested at most marches. Um, <clears throat> so we were kind of floundering trying to figure out what to do. Meanwhile, we couldn't turn to NEFAC because they hated the hell out of us um, because, <laughs> because of what people who had already left had done. So we didn't really have like older, experienced leadership to kind of, you know, teach us, um, which that's always been something that I've found to be very important is to, you know, ask people who've done it before. Look to people who are older than you. Um, so not having that was, was quite hard. Um, finally, around the spring of 2006, there was a, a big movement from especially undocumented workers and the, the immigrant rights movement to take May Day and make it into something again in the United States, into something real again. Um, and in Boston, there was going to be a big march for what they called the, the Great American Boycott. They were pretty much calling for a general strike on May Day. Um, so I was like, where the hell are the anarchists? We've had to do something, right? Um, so a few of my friends um, kind of tried to figure out how to get her stuff together, uh, started a, you know, a push to, to gather the, the anarchists together for May Day and figure out how to best put our efforts forward. Um, so out of this push, um, you know, we built a lot, a lot of new connections with other groups in Boston and met a lot of other anarchists that we hadn't met before. And Bam was sort of getting his feedback under it. Um, the marches were awesome. It was, you know, a, it was a pretty great time to, to be active. Um, very inspiring. 
Um, so I mentioned, you know, looking to older folks. One of the uh, older folks whom, whom I met at the time, um, who had be become involved in the movement in the '60s, um, was uh, his name was James Harrod, and you know, he helped me get this book out. Um, but at that time, you know, he was very influential to me in terms of, you know, my my understanding, my encouragement. Um, he really helped me understand class um, in a way that you know hadn't really been explained to me before. Um, and one of the things that James Herod really focuses on is the neighborhood assembly and the popular assembly. You know, the the directly democratic models that exist in almost any revolutionary period. That that's a true revolution from from the people from below. Um, whatever they call it, there's almost always a, a public assembly that, you know, is the, I think, you know, most democratic governing group that, you know, a revolutionary movement can have. Um, he ha had just put out a book about that uh, called Getting Free, um, which I, I bet they have here. I hope so. I've seen it here at different times. It's a great book. You should definitely check it out. Um, um, so meanwhile, as if to back up everything James Harry was saying, the uprising in Oaxaca, Mexico had, you know, just started, you know, at the, at the end of that May, um, and they were formed, they formed a popular assembly um, of the people of Oaxaca, Apo in, in Spanish, um, and that was really inspirational to us and BAM, you know. So that summer we were doing, you know, uh, pretty much standouts for, for the Oaxaca movement. Um, on the Boston Common, and like handing out propaganda, we'd write about them and talking to talking to just normal people, like, "Hey, don't you think we shouldn't have cops or politicians?" And most people on the Boston Common, we stopped, were like, "Hell yeah!" <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so that was, you know, another important part of our development. Um, and then in August, um, I got the idea that we should do a commemoration for Sacco and Benzetti, uh, who were, you know, two Italian anarchists in Boston who were executed um, by the state of Massachusetts in a really, really terrible, uh, ridiculous sham of a trial. Um, they, they died in 2007, and, you know, I kind of recognized, well, next year is going to be the 80th anniversary. You know, maybe we should start kind of... I'm, I'm very into history and anniversaries, as you might have noticed already, so I, <laughs> I apologize for that coming out. But um, <clears throat> So we also were looking around at the immigrants' rights movement and the Green Scare, which was going on in which uh, especially animal rights and environmental rights uh, anarchists had been targeted for repression by the FBI across the country and especially in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and in Boston at that time, the main, the main split in the anarchists was no longer platformist versus anti-platformist. We were still pretty much all anarcho-communists, but some of us were more focused on the workers and some of us were more focused on the environment. And this is big to do, it was pretty stupid. Um, as if workers don't need the environment, or the environment can't be saved without the people being behind the movements to save it. Um, so we got the idea of using Sacco and Manzetti's memory to try to start bringing these two groups together. Um, you know, Sacco and Manzetti were targeted for their beliefs more so than anything, um, and that's why they're executed. The judge even said, did you see what I did to those anarchist bastards after he denied their appeal that led to their execution? Um, on the other hand, the immigrants' rights movement was, you know, pretty inspirational, and there was a lot of good organizing going on around there, and anarchists in Boston who were involved on the ground in that, that we'd hope to sort of bring into this. Um, so we had a speaker from the L.A. immigrant rights uh, movement and a speaker from a Boston anarchist uh, animal rights group called the uh, Boston Animal Defense League, um, and it was sort of the beginning of this big effort to try to bridge the green-red divide. Um, <clears throat> so that led to the formation of the Northeast Anarchist Network, um, which happened in Boston as well as around here. There were a, a bunch of consultas. Uh, I think there were two in Amherst, two in Boston, uh, one in New York City, one in Philly, a couple in Ithaca. For, for a few years, we, we built this, this pretty loose network. Um, based on trying to bridge this, you know, the divide and the different anarchist tendencies. Um, because in BAM, you know, we'd are always been about, you know, a non-sectarian anarchism where, you know, we tr a big tent policy pretty much where we try to get everybody together. Um, the problem, as, you know, I, you could see looking back on BAM as well as you could see on the ground in Nian was that 
these people just don't really agree. <laughs> you know, they, they sometimes don't have the same definition of anarchism as each other, and they definitely don't have the same strategies. Um, and while I still maintain that, you know, different strategies can complement each other, it just never really played out. Um, Neanderthal did some pretty cool things um, that someone else should write a book about. Um, they are especially active um, getting uh, affinity groups down to summit protests against the IMF and um, the different conventions. Um, and, you know, the, the, the consultants that were held in different cities, I think, almost always strengthened those cities and brought new people into, into the groups there. Um, but it just ha had a really hard time functioning um, to do more than, you know, publish a newspaper and hold meetings or get people out to protest. Uh, there wasn't really the possibility of campaigns, and we tried that a few times. Um, Unfortunately, um, <clears throat> but the other spark that kind of hit us from this big Oaxaca movement and the um, immigrant rights movement was just the realization, which somebody could have very easily just told us beforehand, <laughs> that as I had you know suspected when I first got involved, like we really need to be involved in our communities. You know, we, you can't be more effective than in the community that you either live, work go to school, et cetera, in your apartment complex, whatever. Um, people around you who you see every day, who you have to live a life with, um, are the people who you have most in common with when it comes time to struggle. Um, so looking at what was happening in Oaxaca and looking out over the city of Boston where there were a lot of anarchists of a lot of different varying ages, but especially very young ones. Most of them lived in collective houses or near their friends in certain neighborhoods. And we got this idea for a uh, neighborhood collectives project where we'd encourage everybody to form different neighborhood uh, anarchist groups with the purpose of getting together, looking around the neighborhood, and getting involved in the struggles in that neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> so these were started in a few different neighborhoods in Boston. Um, I was living in Alston Brighton at the time, and a group of about six of us who had really come together around the Oaxaca uh, solidarity stuff over the summer um, kind of formed a, a neighborhood collective. Um, there were uh, collectives in, in Dorchester. Um, one was formed in like the Central Square, Inman Square area. <clears throat> one was formed down the Cape um, with, you know, a lot of comrades are still very connected with that we actually met through this. Um, the police formed a fake collective called the P-Block Collective to <laughs> infiltrate the, the Northeast Anarchist Network, um, which is pretty silly. Um, but you know, we didn't have any train anyone to train us in how to do community organizing. Um, we didn't really have anyone to look to other than like people who lived in southern Mexico, um, <laughs> whose languages we mostly didn't speak. Um, but we also, I don't know, it, it was probably my favorite time of being in BAM because we were very, very involved and it felt like what we were doing was right. Um, in, in our neighborhood, our collective first uh, reached out to the, the Charles View um, it's like a low-income housing uh, complex um, in Lower Alston, right down the street from where we were living. And there was a tenants association that was fighting against an attempt from Harvard University to buy it out. Um, we hadn't quite figured it out yet, but Harvard had actually um, used a fake real estate company to buy up almost that entire neighborhood up to that point. And the Charlesview was one of the last important pieces to it. Um, so we, we worked with these, these tenants um, to fight against Harvard um, and, you know, there were a lot of other neighbors who were going to the, the meetings that the, the mayor and the Boston Redevelopment Authority, which is uh, pretty much subservient to the mayor, um, were holding. Um, and that was pretty much the entirety of activism in the neighborhood was going to these public meetings and, you know, kind of raising a stink. Um, so, you know, believing in assemblies as we had. Um, in talking to some of our other neighbors, we brought together people in the Alston Brighton Neighborhood Assembly, which uh, lasted for from 2006 to about two, late 2009. Um, and at the start, it was really incredible. There were a lot of different people from all different backgrounds. Um, however, um, we were pretty open about, you know, radical ideas, and um, eventually the uh, the redevelopment. Um, nonprofit in the neighborhood kind of subverted us. You know, we, we had members who were like paid staffers of theirs. They actually started a different, very similar group that kind of the middle class, respectable people in the neighborhood sort of like 
shifted everything over to, um, and we were really unable to do any type of actions, like no marching, um, no rallies. We couldn't get anybody to any of that stuff after a couple of months. And we ended up resorting to kind of like uh, minority tactics, like uh, dropping banners is mostly what we did. Um, but we uh, disrupted Harvard uh, commencement. Uh, we and a, f a few other pretty <coughs> interesting things that were completely covered up in the media. Um, there were also a few other projects started, you know, in that neighborhood, out of this neighborhood collective. Um, at one end of, you know, if I don't know how familiar you all are with the Alston Brighton neighborhood, um, but Harvard is coming down from the top, um, Boston College is coming from the west, and BU is pushing from the east. Um, so it's. You know, it's, it's a neighborhood that my, my father comes from, and it's, you know, very different than when I was a kid and I used to go visit my grandmother because it's being pretty much crushed to death by, by the colleges in different ways. Um, but a couple members of our collective had been BU students at the time, and they started a BU anarchist organization that actually still exists um, uh, out of, you know, out of our collective. Um, there were also members who of our collective who worked at this... Uh, vegan pizza place called TJ's, um, who ended up uh, leading a campaign to pretty much kick the boss out. He still owned it, but he didn't like go there, <laughs> and they, they ran it collectively. Uh, very strange. Um, but that was a TJ's vegan pizza people might have heard of, but you know, there's more about that in the book. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you know, when, when, when we were involved in our neighborhoods and when we were working with these other groups that, you know, weren't explicitly anarchist. Uh, we were making a lot of new relationships and I think building a stronger community and bringing more people in to what we were doing than we had been um, by, you know, holding educational events for students who, you know, while a lot of us are students, a lot of students also just leave at the end of their, their stay in Boston and we have this kind of very uh, frustrating high turnover, you know, in the Boston anarchist movement. Um, <clears throat> so, the following year, for the Soccer Women's Eddie Parade, we decided to launch our own publication. Um, now that now that we were involved in a lot of different things in the city, there's also a fight in the neighborhood of Roxbury against the uh, BU Biolab, which um, is where they're going to develop um, anthrax and other pretty much uh, biological weapons um, for the use of fighting them allegedly. But they're obviously doing it in a working class and people of color neighborhood um, because they're not going to do it on Beacon Hill or in Brookline. Um, so that, that's, that's been a long fight that's about to heat up again. But we were involved in all these different, you know, little fights separately. Um, and there was also just a lot of anarchist culture. Soon, at, soon after, our first, our first few issues actually had things about the Greek anarchists, which we all thought were really cool because even back then, you know, bef before the big uprising, Greek anarchists were known to like beat up cops, and the cops would like say, "I have children, don't hurt me." And, you know, these were the stories we'd get. Like, <laughs> they'd uh, they'd attack police stations or banks, and no one would get arrested because people would defend them and you know hide them. So this was very also inspiring to us. And then in you know December, that December, um, oh, the following December <clears throat> was the uh, you know the economic collapse, and then the Greek uprising was a I think a pretty direct. Uh, response in terms of a emotional out outpouring of the people to the, you know, beginning of the collapse. Um, if folks don't know about the Greek uprising, there's a lot about that in my book. Um, it lasted for about a month. It was caused when police entered an anarchist neighborhood in Athens, which is a huge and awesome anarchist neighborhood, and shot a, a kid because the kids all came and threw bottles at them to leave, because that's what they do in this neighborhood cool it is. <laughs> they shot this, this kid named Alexis and by that night there were police stations being burnt across the country. Um, and you know that you could read more about that. Um, but it was also the time of you know the economic collapse I think also led a lot of people to question what they had previously held as you know as truth, just as the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War had, um, you know, shakes up people's ideologies at times of crisis. Um, so we were <clears throat> simultaneously, some, well, some of us are trying to push towards more of this social struggle work. Um, however, some of us also looked at Greece and said, okay, the Greek anarchists are on the streets fighting, we should be on the streets fighting. 
without, you know, thinking about the, maybe, maybe they thought about it, but without participating in, you know, years of building those sort of movements and community connections that are kind of necessary to back up people who are fighting in the streets and to give that fighting meaning, um, to make that fighting a social struggle instead of more of an individualistic outpouring of, you know, of protest. Um, so this was a, in Boston, summits became once again really the big thing for anarchists to do. Uh, our friends were holding meetings like weekly for months before different summits and then afterwards they were too burned out to do anything so a lot of the local projects floundered. Um, and then you know people would get arrested and beat up and hurt and there'd be all this bail work we'd have to do. Um, I don't personally think it's a good idea to go fight your enemy where they have the biggest budget and the biggest force and are expecting you and have infiltrated you beforehand. Um, I think it's probably better for us to be fighting where we live um, around the, the smaller struggles that um, you know affect us and our neighbors more directly. However, if the DNC or something came to Boston again, I'd be out there defending my city again. So I'm definitely aren't going, not, not going to take anything away from people who find summit protests important because they definitely can be big catalysts for, for movements. Um, it just can't be the only thing we do uh, because then the movements can't exist. So, <clears throat> um, this is getting towards the end of, you know, the end of BAM's run. Um, you know, we, we were kind of spread out pretty thin. Um, our newsletter and the actions and all the events we were holding in Boston were bringing in a lot of people a lot faster than we could really develop, you know, real connections with them. And our political, you know, cohesion was, as well as our social cohesion was, getting pretty shaky um, and you know people like me and a few friends around me were feeling very burnt out about the fact that you know we really did most of the work but um, because it was a a monthly public meeting that just about any anarchist who walked into Boston would hear about and you know half of them would come to we'd have like 40 people 50 people in meetings like routinely mm -hmm. half of which we'd never met before all of whom had the same you know right to to the consensus process as you know the people who were doing the the day-to-day -day work um, it was getting very hard. Some of our comrades suggested that we make BAM a closed collective, so no, you know, have an open public monthly event, but make you know the decision making, the business meeting happen at a different time for a specific collective members. That person promptly left the group soon after, and nobody really carried the idea forward. But we sort of made half measures towards it, and it just became a mess. Um, there are also a lot of you know uh, patriarchal issues with certain people in in the group, and. Um, in combination with the fact that most of the people who we were bringing in through our newsletter turned out to be men, um, we, we started having these meetings where there'd still be 30 or 40 people, but there'd only be a couple people who weren't, you know, male body. Um, so that definitely was a big deterrent on, you know, a lot of the longer standing BAM members, because up to that point, BAM had always mostly been like a majority uh, non male bodied organization, um, but it was a very drastic shift that we just couldn't figure out how to recover from. Um, <clears throat> so during all of this, I had already known that I was going to leave Boston. Um, <clears throat> my wife had gotten into a graduate school program in Pittsburgh for a year where she could become a children's librarian in, you know, it was like eight months, nine or ten months of schooling, so it was a really good opportunity. So during this big transition period, I was, you know, and, and I had played a fairly central role in the organization, in the running of the organization. Um, for, from, you know, 2006 till, you know, about this time, 2009. Um, but I didn't want to really influence the direction of the group anymore because I didn't feel it was honest. Because I had had my own sort of political changes um, and had actually joined uh, NEFAC um, around the same time. Um, so I didn't really want to, you know, influence where, where the group was going. Um, and so it, there was a lot of, I think, indecision and disagreement and disheartenment among people. Um, however, you know, through our Greek solidarity work, we'd also gotten connected with um, the Greek anti-authoritarian movement, which at the time, I think still is, probably the, the largest anarchist group in Greece that, you know, 
and I'm large like thousands of people, like not large like you know thirty people. Um, <laughs> so they they uh, had actually voted at one of their assemblies to like make us a member of their of their organization. And um, the summer before I moved to Pittsburgh, my wife and I went to Bulgaria and then to Greece because um, we stopped working early and wanted to see some things. Um, so I was sitting in that anarchist neighborhood I mentioned before, it's called Exarchia, um, talking to one of the people from Alpha Kappa, which is the Greek anti-authoritarian movement, about the certain things that we could do. And I checked my email and see that the band meeting that had just happened, people had decided to dissolve the organization. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> so that was that was disheartening. And this was also right when I had started writing, you know, the history of BAM. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but pr possibly at that time, BAM was beyond saving. Um, so after that, you know, I was in Pittsburgh for a year, and it was a really good opportunity for me to look back on what I'd been involved in since I was 16. You know, I really didn't have a chance to, like, look. I think a lot of us as activists, you know, every day there's, there's something we have to get done. There's always an immediate goal. Sometimes we lose sight of, of the long-term goal and with it the past of where we've been and how effective we've been towards it. Um, so that's really the context in which I, I was sitting down and, you know, putting this together, um, looking at what we'd done, thinking about how effective we had been, and thinking about what we should do in the future. Um, <clears throat> so I think that, moving on to the future, that there's, you know, a few... Th I think anarchists should strive to have a couple different groups, a couple different types of projects. You know, one, I think, probably most importantly is that anarchists should organize themselves among people whom they agree with about you know both the long term and the short term and these sort of specific political organizations that can because of that unity and that strength in those relationships developed internally um, operate a lot more effectively in the broader social movements where you know political unity is often very you know very small and um, is more about you know the the goals of um, you know, certain oppressed groups or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, though, that other role of anarchist organization to, to teach people about anarchism, it can be done, you know, in the, in the moment of the struggle. You know, people learn a lot by struggling and from the people they struggle with, um, but there's also, I think, still a place for just reaching out to students and saying, hey, come learn about anarchism. You know, we're going to have a workshop. Um, so I think that anarchists should strive to do both, to have, you know, the internal group, um, such as NEFAC had been and, and continues to be under the name of Common Struggle, which, you know, uh, the, the local here as well as myself are a member, um, but also strive to do the same thing that BAM had been doing, which is bringing, re reaching out to a broader section of anarchists as well as people who are, um, I guess, just naturally inclined to anti-authoritarian ideas, who are the people who are always flooding into our meetings that we, we had never met. It was always amazing how many new people you meet at a meeting that you go to every month. Um, I think that that's valuable too. Um, <clears throat> so I guess you should buy my book and read about all this stuff. And <laughs> also think about, you know, the work that you may have may be doing and, you know, evaluate that as well. Um, I think it's very useful for, for us to look towards our past um, both distant past, you know, like the, the glorious moments that, you know, inspire us as, as radicals, such as, you know, the Spanish Revolution or, you know, the Ukrainian Revolution or Paris in 68, or, um, but also what we've been doing yesterday and last week and two years ago, because um, it's all part of one big social and political uh, continuum or whatever. Um, so <clears throat> um, that said, and looking towards the future, um, one one project I'm very excited about is, um, you know, Common Struggle, as well as a lot of other organizations across the country, and some organizations as well in Canada, have been talking for years about, you know, bringing class struggle anarchist groups together, the type of anarchist groups that are willing and um, dedicated to working in within social movements to um, all that stuff I have talked about, um, but to to merge all these groups into one big federation. Um, so people should definitely keep their eyes up for that because that, I think, has a, a lot of potential um, in this country. Um, the other thing that I'm uh, currently excited about is um, helping to launch a new publication in the Boston area um, called The Cradle of Liberty. 
Um, it's you know it's, it's run by a, a, an anarchist collective, um, but we're much less focused on you know anarchisty uh, things. It's, it's mostly just like news from from the streets, like what, what the unions are doing, what the community groups are doing, um, and trying to spread the idea of the practices. Um, so that's my talk. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, I remember. I remember here. Um, you know, there are, like people start putting up flyers about the biotech uh, convergence in in Boston, um, and there was a lot of. I, I forget what year that was, but I was a student at UMass at the time, and there's a lot of like excitement. From that was um, May 2007. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that was um, a few months after the founding uh, consulta of the Northeast Anarchist Network, um, and the the impetus for this consulta had been the fact that bio was happening the same week as May Day in Boston, mm -hmm. and you know our goal was to yeah, as I mentioned before, we were really focused on trying to bridge this red green divide at the time, so that looked like a perfect opportunity for us. The consulta was like. A hair pulling disaster. It was it was terrible. Um, that unity really wasn't there. But somehow, out of that, people decided, hey, let's start a network together. <laughs> um, but and there was a lot of excitement from from UMass Amherst students. There was a large contingent that was very active in that founding. Um, that you know, pretty effectively bridged that divide in a really nice way, actually. Um, but you know, that's that's why there are a lot of the founding meetings were out here. <coughs> Movement, yeah. uh, you know, and it was a way for people to to get together and meet in these broad, broad ways. But yeah, it was all over the place. I had uh, recently gotten uh, in, involved in NEFAC, um, which is a very specific kind of political position. So it was uh, exhausting to be at that meeting. I had no idea that there so could be so many different points of divergence. Yeah. Well, there were anarchists who were involved in the draft resistance movement in Boston, which Boston was one of the centers of the draft resistance movement during the Vietnam War. Um, and then in the 70s, uh, the Black Rose organization formed in Boston, which is, a, I think, in many ways, almost a precursor to BAM, because it was sort of similar. It didn't have a very specific political position, and mostly it was, the big thing that Black Rose did was a lecture series and a publication. So similar to BAM, it was about education, um, both through, you know, event planning and through publishing. Um, but I don't really know much of what was happening in the 80s. I know there was the uh, Anarchist Drinking Brigade. Um, I'm not sure what they did besides drink and discuss in the 80s. That was when Reagan was president. Yeah. Must have been a terrible time. Uh, I was four when the 80s ended. So. Um, <laughs> But yeah, definitely the 90s is when, I guess, what, what the current wave, or the, the, what would be young elders of the current wave, mm -hmm. you know, are coming out of. Was there a connection between BAM? You mentioned that BAM en uh, ended around stations. Um, definitely, there's been a lot of connection. Um, I mean, it's very unfortunate that BAM didn't exist during Occupy, because um, there wasn't really an active anarchist organization <clears throat> suited to operating within Occupy to, you know, do the things I had mentioned that anarchists should do in social movements, you know, push for democracy, more radical tactics, and, um, you know, to work with the most oppressed people affected by the different issues. Um, what really filled that role, um, first, I guess, was sort of the informal networks left over from BAM. So one of the most active of the anarchists in the Occupy movement is a friend of mine named Matt Carroll, um, who was the longest running member of BAM. He joined soon after it founded, and he didn't, you know, he, he was there, I think, at the last meeting. Um, so he was there for so was nine years. So there were like individuals from BAM who were participating in it. Um, there was also the Industrial Workers of the World branch in Boston is very largely an anarchist organization. Almost everybody in it is anarchist, and it was very active in Occupy as well. And I think of all of the, you know, libertarian left groups in Boston, it saw a huge, uh, you know, huge rise in, in membership and participation because of his involvement in Occupy. 
Um, so a lot of band members have always been in the IWW, so those connections were there as well. Were you part of Occupy? Yeah, I was involved um, mostly through the IWW and through Common Struggle. Um, I taught a, a teaching on street tactics, the one that band used to teach. Um, I was one of the founding members of the uh, Labor Outreach Committee that um, brought a lot of the unions on board and did different events with them. Um, you mentioned you were from Franklin, mm -hmm. and I'm actually from Attleboro, and I have a lot of friends oh, who are nice. from Franklin. Yeah. I know that town very well. But so I don't actually go into Boston all that much. I actually mm -hmm. spent a lot of time, though, in Providence. And okay. I, I saw the Occupy movement on a pretty regular basis in Providence. Was the Occupy movement in Boston uh, connected to Rhode Island? I mean, did they have people who uh, um, I'm sure that were they, they connected were, I mean, or were they organized? Occupy together? in Boston was very, very large and very. It, it wasn't. It didn't have a lot of like sort of cohesion. So there were a lot of different you know peripheral groups, committees doing their own thing, um, and the only way they'd really report back on it were these monster. Uh, public assemblies or general assemblies that they hold that would go on for three or four hours and most people couldn't stand <laughs> so I, I'm not sure what the connection was with with Providence but I know that common struggle has a chapter in Providence and you know we our, our comrades down there were involved in Occupy Providence um, so I think that you know it was it was different than than Boston in many ways in Providence um, but one other thing that we did to kind of, you know, participate in Occupy Boston along the lines of BAM is towards the end of, you know, right before Occupy Boston got evicted from, from their encampment, um, yeah. we were starting to form what we called the Anarchist Alliance, kind of like influenced by like Bakunin's Anarchist Alliance and the First International, but very similar, sorry, to, to what BAM was, like just a coordinating body for anarchists participating in things. Um, in the Occupy movement, um, and when it existed, we were like, "Why didn't this exist before?" We really needed this for this period of time. The, the way I look at anarchist organization, we need to build them. We need to keep us strong. You know, us keep us ourselves educated, trained, and active. And then there's going to be periods of time, such as you know what was happening during Occupy, where our ideas are suddenly relevant, where people are more willing to struggle where they are, and that's when you know, we really got to spring into action. Um, so the fact that we had kept this group along for, for so long, and, you know, that sort of being the, I think, the, the height of, of public dissent in that entire decade. Was occupied? I think so. I, yeah. you know, you know, during the Iraq War, everybody was against the war, but um, the connection to, you know, class and issues of, the econo of economics and things like that weren't so publicly held as, you know, I'd, I'd be talking to my coworkers and everybody would be like, oh yeah, Occupy is doing this awesome thing, you know, and people would be coming into the store who, you know, I work in a grocery store, would be coming in who met me at Occupy or, or just saw me at passing at Occupy and wanted to talk about it. And I think in Boston in that moment, it was, um, you know, it, it was on everybody's mind. And I just wonder, you know, thinking about political strategy with all this, if, if, if there's, there's a way in which um, anarchist projects become about um, that, that they don't always clarify to the, to the extent necessary um, how political changes is, is going to happen. Um, yeah. And, and, and maybe maybe there's there's room for more theoretical disagreement, you know, in all this about what what, what do we mean by taking power. Um, you know, is it just about taking power in, in the workplace? I mean, are we still wedded to the old kind of idea of like federations of workers' assemblies being like the nucleus of a of a new society? Um, so I, I mean, I, I just think that that um, anarchists sometimes have a hard time taking ourselves seriously yeah. as to the feasibility of our ideas, and I think that 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 plays out in how we're able to to make those you know, steps. So, I mean, these are obviously problems I'm grappling with, and I'm curious about how, how you're grappling with the questions of a big picture of political strategy, taking our ideas seriously enough, you know, in, in, the, in the period of time that we're, you know, not in, in revolutionary upsurge. Right. And I don't include, by the way, the <coughs> Occupy movement as a moment of revolutionary upsurge. But. Right. Yeah, me neither. Um, 
thought it was better than what we had. Um, uh, no, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I think a lot of it comes from a, a poor reading of history. Um, anarchist ideas are actually one of the most uh, important of the socialist ideas. Prior to the Russian Revolution, um, anarchists were, you know, in many places, more popular than than their Marxist uh, allies. Um, a great book that focuses on that is Black Flame um, by some uh, South African anarchists, um, Schmidt and Van der Waalt, um, that talks a lot about the broad groups. A lot of them are unions or you know movements, workers' movements that existed in almost every continent that were you know, pushing for the anarchist form of socialism. Um, <clears throat> more, you know, talking about today and the future, you know, so, so that's the past. I think that, as I mentioned, you know, I'm a big fan of history, and I think it's important for us to look at what's happened before in order to know what to do in the moment and what to do in the future. Um, but for the present, um, I mean, you, you kind of touched on the you know, the, the identity of being an anarchist and how important that is to many anarchists. Um, you know, our organization changed its name from NEFAC to Common Struggle, you know, I think, and for many reasons because of that as well, um, to kind of put forward the idea without necessarily the word. Um, however, you know, Common Struggle, Libertarian Communist Federation, I, I think it's debatable whether or not anarchism is more poisoned a term than communism or libertarianism both of which I think are pretty pretty poisoned. However, to me, they're all just names, and you know, the more important thing is the you, you have to build relationships with people in order to get to the point where you can actually explain these ideas, especially how these ideas um, relate to you and me in our daily lives. Um, so, again, for me, it comes back to having really strong organizations where we have this kind of internal culture and development um, where you know, we could we can learn, we could have these debates, we could think long term, um, we could think about how we're using our resources in the movements we're in and how those movements are forwarding us towards revolution. Because it's true, the, the biggest criticism, one, one of my articles starts in this, um, it's called What We Want and How We're Going to Get It, which yeah, probably best, best uh, answers your uh, <clears throat> question. But the first line is, the most common and valid criticism of anarchism is that it appears to lack a concrete and cohesive vision for the future. Um, you know, it's easy to say, okay, screw the government, you know, authority is bad, but to explain that to, you know, your mom, how her life would be in a, a society where there was no government, how it would be different, how it would be the same, let alone how we're going to create that, I think is something that anarchists often, you know, either overly simplify, overly romanticize, or just say, oh, the people will figure that out. Um, so. That doesn't answer your question at all, but I, I guess I agree with your <laughs> with your sentiment. This is something that I think in our organizations and in our, our circles that we need to we need to think about the actions that we take, the groups we participate in, the movements that we're active in, how they relate to the bigger social question, you know, in in the economy and, and political context in which we are, um, and what the potentialities are in those movements for you know change in the future. Um, I think that anarchists should write things like programs that organizations believe in that, you know, set forth the types of steps that people should take during revolutionary periods as suggestions, you know, not as, not as mandates, of course, but, um, because I think it's important for people to, to grasp an idea, to, you know, to, to put your body and your life on the line for something that seems as crazy as anarchism, I think we at least owe people an explanation of, you know, what we what we want, and that's something that we grapple with. I, I mentioned, you know, the the period around 2004, 2005, when most of the people, the elders, I would call them in BAM, had left, even though they were like in their thirties, um, they were really the elders in, in BAM. Um, you know, I, I mentioned in passing that like we didn't really have the the discipline and the the training to do the kind of street actions that BAM had been doing before that time, um, so. Black Block, instead of being a tactic, Black Block is when anarchists dress in all black and cover their faces. Um, the, it's a tactic to accomplish direct action, to protect people's identities and protect people in those actions. Um, it just became the default way that anarchists marched in Boston. So instead of coming to a Black Block with your affinity groups and plan, people would just 
showing up and putting on their bandanas, which would only scare our allies, scare the people who we were, had a message for, and attract the police to us. So people were getting arrested every march, but we didn't have a reason to be in Black Bloc because we didn't have the, you know, the affinity groups and the networks the, you know, to even attempt any actions that would necessitate the Black Bloc in the first place. Um, so I, you know, if we had read, if, if we had <coughs> unnecessary freakiness is kind of what we <laughs> um, and you know, for a while we tried to do this. We, we called it like info block instead of a uh, black block. Where we, I think this is probably where the idea for the newsletter came out of. Really, um, you know, we just write things or do other media and hand that out on the march, um, and like dress normal, like, like we're going to work or school or wherever we go in our normal lives. A punk show, as maybe most for most of us at the time. You know, being against racism and homophobia, you know, these sort of things are, I think for, for our generation of, you know, people born in the 80s or later, has become like pretty normal, you know, people are like, I don't know, maybe it's not the case everywhere, of course, but just my, growing up in eastern Massachusetts, you yeah. know, that's sort of, sort of my uh, take on it. And this was a group from the early, that started in the early 70s, so yeah. it's like a totally it's very different, different time. Different time.